You remember The Wizard of Oz, right? Dorothy, red slippers, the yellow brick road, the Tin Man, etc., etc. One of the key plot twists in this movie occurred with the revelation of the wizard's deception. You see, he was known as a mysterious, majestic, and powerful being who ruled over Emerald City. But his deity-like persona was eventually exposed and he was revealed to be but a mere man. In an atheism versus Christianity debate, skeptic Frank Zendler implicitly compared the revelation of the wizard in the movie to what he believed was a lack of proof for Christianity. He cleverly stated, what do you do with the Wizard of Oz once you find out there is no Oz? For the Christian, we have a similar question to consider when it comes to the central event of the Christian faith. What do you do with Jesus if there is no evidence for the resurrection? This question is often posed by non-believers like Zingler, but interestingly, its origin comes from within the New Testament. The New Testament writer Paul faced the sobering implications of such a revelation when he stated in 1 Corinthians 15:17. And if Christ had not been raised from the dead, your faith is worthless. The credibility of Christianity is contingent upon the resurrection of Christ. So what is the evidence for the resurrection? What could be so compelling to persuade the late rabbi and Jewish theologian, Pinchas Lapid, to declare that he accepted the resurrection of Easter Sunday, not as an invention, but as a historical event? What weight of evidence could shift the thinking of Dr. Frank Morrison, a journalist set out to write a book disproving the historicity of the resurrection of Jesus, but ended up writing a book called Who Moved the Stone, which validated the historicity of the resurrection narrative. All four biographies of Jesus, better known as the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, include the resurrection of Jesus. For the next few minutes though, I wanna briefly highlight four of the most important pieces of the resurrection puzzle that help show the historical reliability of the event. Those include Jesus' death by crucifixion, his burial, the empty tomb, and the post-resurrection eyewitness experiences. So our first point, Jesus' death by crucifixion. The Gospels and several non-Christian sources, including Jewish historian Josephus, record the fact that Jesus died by one of the most horrendous and painful forms of capital punishment called crucifixion. This typically involved a person being nailed or bound to a cross, but for Jesus, it was the former. Historian Martin Hengel noted in his book entitled Crucifixion that although crucifixion was prevalent in the ancient world as a barbaric form of execution, outside of some Roman sources, the most detailed accounts of the kind of torture can be found in the Gospels. Because as Hengel stated, no ancient writer wanted to dwell on how long and cruel this procedure was. Yet some posit alternatives to the actual death. Well, this is problematic for several reasons. Number one, the Gospels detailed Jesus' vicious torture prior to the crucifixion. This included him being beaten, enduring flogging, which was akin to several whoopings, and having a crown of thorns placed on his head. The amount of blood loss from all this, in addition to the crucifixion, made survival incredibly unlikely. Number two, also, the Roman executioners declared him dead before removing him from the cross. Typically, they would break the legs of the crucified individual so that they could no longer push themselves up for breath and would ultimately suffocate. They didn't do this with Jesus because he was already declared dead. Furthermore, the Journal of American Medical Society investigated his death in an article entitled On the Physical Death of Jesus Christ. They concluded from that article that clearly the weight of historical and medical evidence indicates that Jesus was in fact dead. Number four, the death of Jesus as a Jewish historian and scholar Paula Fredrickson once stated is the single most solid fact about Jesus' life. But after he died by crucifixion, he was recorded to have been buried. 
This is an important part to the story because without a verifiable burial, the empty tomb portion makes no sense. So the gospels record that Jesus was buried in a tomb by Joseph of Arimathea. He was a member of the local council. So he was likely a well-known individual, which means his tomb was in a well-known place in Jerusalem. Moreover, Joseph didn't bury him alone. There were multiple witnesses to this burial. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the two Marys, and some women from Galilee. And if that wasn't enough, Pilate, the Roman official who ultimately gave the order for Jesus to be crucified, ordered guards to stand and watch the tomb. There were many eyewitnesses and ways to verify Jesus' entombment, but these facts only go to make our next point even more substantial and that's the empty tomb. Several days after being crucified and buried, Jesus' well-known and guarded tomb that had a huge stone rolled in front of it was found to be empty. The first witnesses to the empty tomb of Jesus were, guess who, women, as they intended to complete the burial process by encasing his body with spices. This detail is small in the narrative, but is incredibly significant. During those times in the ancient Near East, the testimony of women was not seen as credible, especially when compared to the testimony of men. So to include such detail further show the authenticity of the narrative. If this were a contrived first century narrative, the conclusion of such a detail would have not been a convincing addition. It would have had the opposite effect. And finally, the eyewitnesses. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul provides a list of post-resurrection eyewitness accounts, including some by name, which means these people can be interrogated about their reports. This account states that over 500 people saw the risen Jesus at different times and in different places during the 40-day period between his resurrection and eventual ascension. Part of what makes this so compelling is that some were not already believers, such as Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul after his encounter. Some eyewitnesses claimed to talk to and had eaten with Jesus, showing that his resurrection was a physical and bodily one. And that there was even one instance where he appeared to 500 people at once. Atheist scholar Gerd Ludman concluded that it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. The evidence of the resurrection of Jesus is not only pertinent to the past, but also powerful in the present. His resurrection is both lamentably in the immense pain he endured on the cross but also laudably in the exquisite sacrificial love he displayed towards us. The resurrection of Jesus ultimately invites those who desire to remove the shackles of moral shame to be in a transformative, eternal, loving relationship with God. And the resurrection of Jesus for all believers is a reminder to always live a resurrected life. One categorized by the greatest moral ethic that Jesus demonstrated on the cross, love. To view videos and resources like this to help you know what you believe and why, visit our website, Jew3Project.org. God bless.